see people coming in. Well, with this, with these two speakers, they're going to be, I mean, there'll be a line of people coming in all, you know, all morning. I know. Although I guess it's now, uh, it's now noon on the East Coast, right? So it's. Uh, yes, it's just a couple yeah. of minutes past. Yeah. Okay, Tom, do you mind? All right, Zoe, so you ready? Sure. Yes, Great. Thank go. you. Thank you. Great. Well, welcome to the webinar hosted by Catholic Investment Services and Asset Strategy Consultants. Thank you for joining us today. Our topic is governance in the age of COVID. My name is Tom Langto, and I'm privileged to serve as Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Investment Services. My colleague, Zayla Estarjan, who you just heard and has done a great job organizing the program, is at the Zoom control panel. Enormous thanks to our distinguished panel, who will be introduced shortly. Today's format will be conversational, and I'll be the moderator. There'll be time for audience questions after the formal part of the program, so please use the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, but the Q&A feature of your Zoom screen to submit a question. Our audience is muted and the program is being recorded. Catholic Investment Services was founded by some of the investment industry's most respected leaders to address the investment challenges faced by Catholic organizations. We are a Catholic nonprofit serving other Catholic nonprofits. Asset Strategy Consultants is a Baltimore-based independent advi investment advisory firm founded in 1991 that primarily serves smaller and mid-sized institutions. ASC serves a number of Catholic clients, including dioceses, colleges, high schools, and religious orders, and has an unparalleled reputation for independence and integrity. We at CIS appreciate the constructive and thoughtful way that ASC serves our common clients. Both firms hope this webinar provides some useful take-home value. Zayla provided biographical information for our speakers, but I want to emphasize a few highlights. As usual, we have a very sophisticated audience today, and I think you'll agree that our uh, panel is more than equal to the task. Paul Stevens is a trustee of Catholic Investment Services, but as importantly, served for many years as the Investment Committee Chair of the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, and continues to serve as a fiduciary for several other noteworthy Catholic organizations. Before his distinguished career as Chief Executive Officer of the Investment Company Institute and in private law practice, Paul served in senior positions at the White House and Department of Defense during the Reagan and Bush administrations. Paul, I always want to say the Eisenhower administration. <laughs> and received, like but, in, but importantly, importantly, Paul received the Department of Defense's highest civilian honor. Andy Connor is Chief Investment Officer of Asset Strategy Consultants, where he oversees ASC's outsourced investment office. Andy's experience includes 12 years as Deputy and Interim Chief Investment Officer for Johns Hopkins University and its $7 billion endowment. CIO Magazine named Andy to its 40 under 40 list, and that was recently, so Andy is still young. And he also serves as treasurer of his church where he helps manage a $2.2 million endowment. Paul and Andy, thank you for contributing your time, talent and experience today and hopefully making me look good. Uh, but before we start our conversation, Paul is gonna offer a short prayer. Tom, thank you. This prayer is taken for the book of Numbers. It's known as the blessing of Aaron. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift his countenance upon us and give us peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul, that was, that was great. Um, so, all right, Paul, I'm gonna ask you to, to bat lead off here and then have Andy be the cleanup hitter. But uh, let's start with Let's start with this this question. What are, what are some of the practical practical ways that COVID nineteen has changed the uh, uh, investment committee governance? Well, one that I've seen, Tom, has been a prominent theme on each of the committees that I serve on, has been the effect of the pandemic upon the business models of the underlying institutions. Obviously, those are highly material to uh, the work of the investment committee. <laughs> the pandemic, for example. Uh, has threatened revenue sources, 
um, upon which Catholic institutions have traditionally been able to rely. Uh, and I think that's virtually all of them. Um, offertories, um, Bishop's Lenten appeals, um, um, frankly, the disposable income that many Catholic lay people have to provide to the church. Um, um, so I think that the considerations that go into what's the business model, what are the revenue expectations and how are they changing? What's gonna be the long-term impact and how do you manage investments around those to meet both operational needs and long-term needs um, is a very significant challenge. And I don't know that we know the answers to these things yet um, because we're still not beyond the pandemic and we don't know what lasting effects it's going to have. So I would think that that's a very big one for committees to ponder. Andy, how, how, from your vantage point, how is the, how are these changes impacted your work? I, I agree with everything Paul said. We've seen, um, particularly in the second half of last year, uh, committees, even investment committees being preoccupied with the, the business models, particularly universities. And um, one client we have is the National Aquarium in Baltimore, where their revenue model is highly reliant on gates so of people visiting the aquarium, which uh, has been non-existent. So that has come front and center. Um, from a practical standpoint, the way we all communicate has changed dramatically. Uh, so I mean, this is a prime example right here, um, not meeting in person. So these quarterly meetings have, have gone to um, you know, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, similar platforms. That really changes the dynamics of, of the meetings from a practical perspective, just getting meeting books and um, meeting materials in, in, uh, in the form that they come. So moving to digital uh, on those from a health and safety early in the pandemic, we didn't know if we should be sending things that we had physically handled to committee members for, for them to handle. And so uh, really like like many things, the pandemic accelerated, I would say the move to, to digital materials and, and um, meeting formats. Uh, those are two of the really obvious uh, ones in the way we communicate. So where, Paul, I think you've answered part of this question already, but do, do we expect any of these changes to continue after the pandemic ends? Well, I think so, Tom. I, I, I don't see us simply returning to, you know, sort of the status quo ante of February, 2020. This is gonna have a longer term impact. Even if you could tell me, well, exactly when is the fear of this uh, uh, pandemic, this virus going to subside? and we can all get back to a normal existence, I think it's going to have lasting impacts. For example, I mean, I think we've now all gotten much more comfortable with and see the value of these types of technologies with which we're, uh, through which we're meeting uh, even now. Um, they allow people to, um, uh, to work remotely. Uh, uh, they're highly efficient in terms of the uses of time because one doesn't have to travel. Um, uh, and shifting time as well. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think the tools will be there. They, I don't think that they're gonna be the complete answer or the exclusive answer uh, because they do present their own problems. For example, onboarding new members of a board or a committee, including an investment committee um, through these devices is a very difficult thing. I think that, that the strongest committees and boards have found that the pre-existing relationships that they had formed prior to moving to these online platforms have really carried them forward. The, I certainly feel that about the committees that I've been serving on. Um, but I do think this is a, this is a change. And, and, and institutions have to consider what effects on their business model. I, I serve one Catholic organization as an advisor on an investment committee, most of the revenues from which are copyrights. Uh, and their copyrights that largely were earned as a result of printed materials. Um, are we going to have as much in the way of printed materials? And how do you shift to a digital environment uh, and, and, and re realize the same degree of, of copyright revenues to support what is a very, very important uh, function that this institution serves on behalf of the church? So all of those, I think, are still question marks, um, but they are going to have lasting impacts. Andy, you're re you, you do a lot of research on these kinds of trends and things. What any any you want to add any thoughts to what Paul Paul suggested? I think I also agree with with Paul. I think we'll 
we'll go back and I think there'll be pent up demand for people to have in, in person experiences and, and get back together when it's safe to do so. But I do think some of these um, trends will, will continue into the indefinite future. We would love to move our clients to digital materials. It's just greener and it's, it's frankly, it's less expensive, um, can be more convenient. Uh, as well as the, the point about travel is, is a good one. Also much greener to not travel to town for a, for a three hour meeting um, every single time. It's also an opportunity uh, to open up your committee membership to, to good people who may have an affiliation or um, you know, a skill set uh, that you would like to have on your committee, but it's not practical for them to attend meetings if they're across the country. So if you had two meetings um, virtually and two in person uh, or continue with virtual meetings, it opens the door to the institution to tap into some of that talent that's not um, really constrained by proximity uh, in the way that meeting in person requires uh, you know, us to do or, or requires us to, to travel to get around that. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Andy. I mean, the reality is that these devices, the, this kind of platform, allows a, a committee to meet more frequently with their managers, um, uh, to understand firsthand um, how they're running the portfolio. Uh, and even between quarterly meetings, if it becomes an urgent need. Um, so there's a real convenience and it can enrich, I think the investment committee process in some ways. Um, so again, Tom, like so many things in life, I think this is a balance and, and striking the right balance long-term is gonna be the challenge. But you're right, Paul. I mean, building building the trust and the relationships uh, that are so important to any kind of any kind of fiduciary governance uh, is is just going to it's just going to be more challenging in a, in a virtual environment. But but uh, uh, but I like your idea about the, the balance. As much as we all miss our trips to the airport, uh, it, there might be some progress here in terms. Of, and I think particularly. Paul, the point you make about being able to meet more frequently uh, or to be able to meet on an ad hoc basis, uh, I think one of the frustrating things for us sometimes is the, the rigid schedule of the investment committee uh, that, uh, well, we meet quarterly and this is, you know, just the ability to be able to pull a group together. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, decision making in a minute, but I, I think that's a real, that's a real plus. So, Paul, back to you. What uh, talk about the role of the of the investment committee chair and and uh, uh, you know has that become more important in in, in this in the in the COVID setting? You know, Tom, one one of the extraordinary experiences I had uh, with the Arlington Diocese was being chair of the investment committee in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and two thousand and nine, and. Um, um, I, I thought to myself that we'd never see anything quite like that again. Um, um, but we had that experience repeated in a much more compressed time frame uh, in the, in the uh, uh, early part of, of 2020, uh, March uh, um, uh, in particular. Um, and, and I think the, the role of the, the committee chair under circumstances like that is particularly important. I mean, the, he or she has got to enlist all of the um, energies and talents of of the um, of the other committee members in support of of the institution's mission and its and its priorities. Um, I think there's a there's a need um, to you know to understand um, and not panic as a result of market events. Um, um, I know that in 2008 to 2009, those people who exited the market precipitously, never knew when to get back in, and they paid a, a real price as a consequence of that. And you would have experienced basically the same thing if you had pulled out of the market in March. Um, so I, I think the role of the, the leadership of a board, the leadership of an investment committee, becomes altogether more important in times of this extreme market volatility. Uh, we don't know when it'll come again, but it will at some point and you've got to be prepared for it. Um, and what that basically means is assuring that you have a strong investment program and discipline in place in advance and then sticking with it. Talk just a minute more about that, about what, 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 that, what that requires. Well, there, there are only so many things that you can do to control your risk in the portfolio, right? I mean, Andy, you can talk about this in, in, in more detail, but. 
Um, you can diversify your, your exposures. Um, you can select good managers, right? Uh, and and uh, um, um, what you can't do is, is uh, time the market um, or predict where markets are going at any particular point in time. Um, so what gets you through is a long-term point of view and just sort of a, a basic discipline about diversification and manager selection. That's at least is my experience. So Andy, that's a good segue to uh, back to you, which is, uh, and you've said several times that the, the first quarter of 2020 was a real wake up call for investors. Talk to us about sort of uh, transition from the point that Paul just made and kind of give us your perspective on that. Right, so just about a year ago, um, we were making the rounds to, to talk to our clients um, regarding the fourth quarter of, of 2019. And, you know, with the end of a, a decade, it, we were in a position where we were kind of reflecting back on the 2010s as a decade. And frankly, it had been, with a couple of exceptions, relatively smooth sailing um, and the market going um, up fairly consistently year, year by year. Uh, and so as a result, a lot of committees we experienced, their, their focus began to narrow. And so you could really tell pretty quickly whether a portfolio, you know, based on their performance, if they had done well or not so well, whether they were globally diversified or just focused on the U.S. As well, and then uh, over time, focus more on U.S. large cap growth um, companies. And then over more time, really five or six names like Microsoft and Amazon and, and Facebook and Google and Apple. And so those companies, which took really narrow leadership in the S&P 500, you could tell, you know, you, you were either underweight, overweight, or at market weight, and it really drove your performance. So committees could be forgiven if they really narrowed their, their aperture of risk and, and weren't spending their quarterly meetings talking about things like inflation or deflation or, um, you know, um, destruction, war, carnage, right? Um, pandemic, uh, not on the radar at that point in time. Um, but our message to clients at that time, point in time was over the next 10 years, we don't necessarily expect it to look like the last 10 years. And so to Paul's point, diversification, very important. And that first quarter from March or February 19th, where the market hit an all time high, to it was down 35% on an intraday basis through March 23rd was an incredible wake up call because we hadn't seen any volatility like that um, for just about a decade. Um, so I think committees, I think it's a reminder that the role of the committee, yes, it's important to choose managers and to focus on that, but also they have to do higher order strategic thinking about the portfolio and positioning it for what could be these you know, massive um, two tail events or two, two sigma or, you know, tail events, right tail, left tail events um, in the way that they design the portfolio after being lulled into just consuming, frankly, consuming more risk, which was rewarded almost unilater unilaterally for a decade. Um, so I think that was a, really the wake up, the essence of this wake up call um, for committees if they were willing to embrace it. Uh, but, you know, frankly, the market went on. And so it reached new highs by the end of the year, once again, yeah. based on historic amount of intervention. So, you know, that lesson, you know, could, could be overlooked or it could be embraced by committees as, as they look forward as, as kind of an object lesson. Um, yeah, and, the, and the bounce back, the bounce back this time around, just like the last time, uh, raises a different challenge, which is rebalancing the portfolio, right? Um, and that's an extraordinarily important uh, uh, discipline for an investment committee to follow, or to make sure that if they've outsourced the investment function um, uh, to um, a manager, um, that that manager is following. It's a it's an odd business, as I've heard many people say, where where you where you you sell your winners and buy your losers. Um, but um, such is the nature of trying to uh, adhere to your investment policies and guidelines um, um, within whatever ranges you've established. Or different classes of assets. Well, the and certainly the speed of the recovery in 2020 saved probably saved a lot of committees from uh, uh, 
making an unfortunate decision like the you know some of the ones you've described. And I think uh, uh, you've both you've both taught me over time that that sometimes doing nothing is a lot is is a lot better than doing the wrong thing. And uh, Paul, what, uh, talk for a minute, and, and I'm going to go rogue here for just a second before we get into sort of more granularity about investments. But what, what, uh, give me a profile of, of, a, of a, the membership of a good investment committee. Uh, you know, I've been on, and I'm a, you know, I'm a fiduciary in a lot of other settings, and, and I've been on investment committees where there have been a lot of strong personalities who are in the business, right? And my experience has been they sort of canceled each other out. Uh, but when, you, when you've been the chair uh, uh, or a, a senior member of an investment committee, what, what's, the, what's the type of person you look to to recruit? Well, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I think what you most want is someone who understands what a good, strong fiduciary process is about. Um, I, I think there can be um, some pitfalls in recruiting people who are active in portfolio or money management themselves, um, particularly if you have a number of them on a committee who may have different views about the markets and where, where the investments need to go. Um, uh, you know, when I, when I was recruited by our, our, our bishop here, I told him, I do not run money, but I know what a good, strong governance and fiduciary process is, and I can guarantee you will have that. Now, within that framework, you want to have people who are conversant with financial markets, who understand, um, you know, sort of modern portfolio management theory and, and, and other things. Um, and you want to have people who are going to, um, who are going to work well together. Um, uh, people who will do the homework because there's a considerable amount of homework to be done uh, over time. Um, we, for example, always interviewed and went through a, a due diligence process with our managers that was quite extensive. And when we had a manager that we decided to let go after a considerable period of giving them a, an opportunity to show what they could do, um, we considered any number of alternatives. And it, that was a big investment of time. So you need people who are truly dedicated to it and, and work well together. And hopefully within that framework have different backgrounds that they, that they bring to the table. Um, um, you you wanna earn and keep the respect uh, of the, of whoever the head of the organization is, whether it's the local ordinary uh, or the chairman of the board of the university and the president, whoever those might be. Um, um, and I don't think they, they, they um, uh, um, should have any motivation in the relationship with the committee except service to God and to his church. And so I think avoiding conflicts in this context is really vitally important. So Andy, amplifying that, who are your best clients uh, from an investment committee standpoint? What's the, what's the profile of your best, you know, I mean, they're all great clients. Right. 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 No, I don't mean, individual, I, don't, I don't mean <laughs> select your, your, your institutions, but just what's sure. the, What's the, what's the most helpful profile for you of an investment committee? I think, you know, the, I agree uh, with Paul. I think having that long-term viewpoint is incredibly valuable and setting that as, as really a committee governance principle. And so you're not reacting to short-term, um, you know, ne negatively short-term um, gyrations or short-term underperformance of a manager, keeping in mind your long-term view and your commitment and, and, and your knowledge of the manager and how they should be performing in a given environment. I, I think that to me, um, you know, as long-term institutions, we have an incredible luxury and a competitive advantage as investors, which is our long-term time horizon. And most investors, even those who have it, most don't uh, utilize it. They don't exploit that advantage. Um, and there are a number of reasons can be just different incentive structures, business risk, um, just never kind of, you know, they're just, you know, frankly, as humans, our base, um, you know, what we come into this world with is a short-term mindset and we react. Um, but if you're trained and, and your governance is really continually reinforcing that long-term um, time horizon, it's a, it opens up the world to, to an incredible, um, advantageous way to invest. And so I would say that that's, if I had to pick one characteristic of a successful investment committee, obviously they 
interpersonal dynamics of the chair is very important in, in making things run, you know, make the making the trains run on time. But just keeping in mind that long-term time horizon is, is really important. So, all right, Andy, you, you're, you were a 40 under 40. You've got a CFA. Paul, you were head of the whole mutual fund industry. You, you argued before the United States Supreme Court. But who better could we have to answer these next two questions, uh, which, which are, uh, and we've touched on some of this already, but how, how has the pandemic changed the investment environment and, and how should committees approach the new investment environment to best position their portfolios in the coming years? Andy, you want to take take that on first? I'll give you the lead on this one. Thank you. Uh, the most so volatility came back, and a reminder of of diversification. If you remember, um, we were talking a little bit before we started about um, maybe if this feels a little bit like two thousand, and you know, technology companies, and you know, maybe a, a bubble uh, or things that feel that way. Um, I think. We start, I started my career in January of 2000 and between 2000 and the end of 2009 is a decade during which the S&P actually went down in value. Um, so that is a very different environment to what we've seen over the last 10 or 11 years. Endowment portfolios and those that were well diversified had significant exposure to, to value, to emerging markets, to international, to real estate, and real assets at that time, mostly energy, some timber. Those things delivered um, in a time when the broad US equity market in general did not generate a return. Um, so I think diversification, just the reminder that you really need to be well diversified uh, it is incredibly important. And then the other, the major one, I think the most persistent is the is the year zero yield environment that we've entered into really that's um, that's a pretty significant change that has affected the entire investment landscape yeah i would agree very very strongly with that second point um, um covid19 is is prompting a level of stimulus expenditures and an increase in government uh, indebtedness unlike anything in our history, and that, that even more than World War II. And uh, it's gonna be uh, really incumbent upon the Federal Reserve for lots of reasons, both to stimulate the economy and to control the costs of government financing uh, to keep interest rates as low as possible for as long as possible. Um, um, that sets the tone for the whole fixed income world. Uh, and, and I think it, it also sets up a dynamic for investment committees not just church related, but all investment committees to try to figure out, well, if we're not getting rewarded um, for fixed income investments of the traditional kind, what, what are some of the alternatives we need to consider? Uh, and remember in the United States, while we think of it, the yields as incredibly low, there are probably about $20 trillion invested worldwide at negative nominal interest rates, uh, which is a, a, a phenomenon that that we've not seen in the United States. We've seen net negative real interest rates with inflation for short periods of time, but not negative nominal interest rates of the sort that many investors in other jurisdictions are coping with. That's a very, very strange chapter in uh, global financial history that we've, we've entered into. Well, to, just to punctuate that point a little bit, Paul, I mean, you, you know, I, I may, I may not have these numbers precisely right, but order magnitude they are. You, you go out and buy a uh, a long-term investor in insurance company uh, uh, endowment, go out and buy a 30-year treasury uh, and you're going to, um, on a million dollar investment, you're going to earn $19,000 a year or something like that. And, and you're going to lose value because the rates are at some point are going to go back up. And, and so it's a, it's a real minefield for uh, uh, the, the whole fixed income market has become a real minefield. And, and as you said, not rewarding. Uh, you're not getting rewarded for the risk, and and uh, so Andy, let's get let's get granular about that. What, how are you seeing institutions addressing this low yield environment? Maybe how are you, you know, as as a CIO, uh, uh, how are you how are you thinking about it? it so it's impacted both the, the, the fixed income markets directly, uh, but also the equity markets, where you know people search for yield elsewhere, and so it. Um, Pushes up valuations in other areas, but in the in the fixed income market, 
traditionally, I think of, of bonds, um, the role in your portfolio is th threefold. So a source of liquidity, um, a source of income or total return, uh, and a source of safety or diversification, right? So um, should be relatively high quality, liquid, and give you some source of return. In today's environment, you can't have all three. <laughs> so pick two, pick two, two of the three um, at most, uh, and, and, you, and you can have um, either income and liquidity, um, in which case you're then taking on risk. So you have to pursue out on the credit spectrum, uh, higher, higher yielding, uh, lower credit quality to get both income uh, and, and relative liquidity. Um, or if you want safety and liquidity, you're not going to have any return. So you, you go to treasuries where the, as we was pointed out, the, the real return is the expected return is, is negative. Or if you want income or total return uh, and relative safety um, the, and, and, you know, diversification, we'll say maybe not so much safety, but not equity risk. So income and diversification, you have to give up on liquidity. So maybe things like um, direct lending strategies um, where, you know, you can really control your credit exposure. There's a lot of different options in, in the market, but you have to, these are illiquid products. And the returns there, the spread there, uh, we're seeing for alternative fixed income, whether it's um, distressed oriented strategies or more likely direct lending, which is a market that's grown incredibly fast. And there are a lot of different flavors from real estate to private equity sponsor backed and, and non sponsor backed transactions and a lot of different options there at different points of, of return and risk. But the spread of alternative fixed income over traditional fixed income, my observation is much wider than the spread we have seen and I expect for private equity over public equity at this point in time. So if you have an illiquidity budget, frankly, um, this is a place to consider it. And big endowments, we did, we had a little bit of direct lending exposure at the, in the investment office at, at Johns Hopkins, but it was not an area that we traditionally invested in very heavily preferring longer duration, private equity, and that sort of thing, venture capital. But this is a time where I think that spread for that you get paid for illiquidity in the alternative fixed income market is, is really um, fairly compelling. Um, but again, you're definitely giving up your liquidity and it's you know maybe a diversifier, but it's not gonna be bereft of risk either. You may not have a straight equity beta, but you're gonna certainly be entailing some, some default risk depending on your implementation. So that's one option. I mean, that's kind of exotic. It's not for everyone. The yeah. others, you know, you could barbell, you could have some very safe kind of treasuries and cash and then some alternative fixed income. Um, frankly, at the church, which you, you mentioned, where we, we manage a very small $2 million endowment, what we've done is to put, um, it's currently six years of um, budgetary support. So we pay out around, say, 5%. We put um, five years um worth of projected budgetary support growing over a year and we put them into CD. So we just laddered a, a C, you know, CD ladder and we're definitely getting less than 1% weighted average on that, but it's more about the safety and the liquidity. So we know that money is there and it frees us up to take the other, you know, 65 or 70 or 60 or 65% of the portfolio and, and to assume equity risk with it because we know we're not gonna panic. If the market is down, we know we have six or seven years in the bank that we can then consume down to fund our budget while we wait for markets to, to come back. So that's a, um, you know, a way that you can implement at a very small scale. Um, and, and it can give you some, some governance mechanisms that enable you to feel comfortable taking a, a fair dose of, of equity risk um, in an environment where frankly, equities could go down pretty significantly given what valuations are. So Paul, you've, you've led a number of committees and, and uh, are fairly sophisticated on alternative investments. I, I think a lot of institutions, because of the change in the in all the changes we've seen in the last year, there are going to be more institutions taking a look for the first time at alternatives. And we don't have time to get into the whole menu of, of, of alternative investing uh, today. But, but what, what, would you, what advice would you give a committee or institution is looking at, at, at a, an alternative strategy. Well, I, I think Tom that it's 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 certainly worth educating yourself about what the alternatives are out there. You know, I, I've spent my whole career involved with regulated funds, the 
registered open end funds principally and, and ETFs and the like, and didn't have a lot of exposure to hedge funds and always associated them with, with uh, you know, sort of swinging for the fences. And, and it's either incredible feast or utter famine and very, very high fees and the like. Um, there, are, there are a world of different hedge funds out there to be considered, some of which are not swinging for the fences, but are looking for more moderate and predictable returns um, that are quite in excess of what you would get in, in traditional fixed income investments that are worth looking at. I know that the, um, the Catholic Investment Services is making um, um, those kinds of alternatives available, even on a Catholic socially screened basis, which is uh, part of the a special challenge that Catholic church organizations have as they consider alternatives. Um, um, but I, you know, I say that recognizing that uh, this is a, a, an additional governance requirement because um, these kinds of investments require a different form of due diligence. Uh, they require sort of a different education. Um, uh, and so they put new demands, perhaps different demands on a committee uh, and its leadership and also uh, outreach to the board that they're serving to make sure that they are comfortable also with the alternatives that are being presented. Well, Andy, so you, you do a lot of due diligence on, on alternative investing. Any, any, any amplification to what Paul said? Yeah, I totally agree. These, these are long-term decisions. Um, so you could be um, signing up with uh, you know, one to three year liquidity for a hedge fund or you know, a 10 year partnership with extensions. So they're really, it's really important to do your due diligence upfront. Um, manager selection is crucial. If you pick the wrong manager, frankly, you will probably just be better off in, in the liquid markets. Um, so it's important to, to be with a partner with, with really good managers. Um, cause it, frankly, it's more like a marriage or, you know, it's a long-term relationship by design. Um, and, and frankly, you may not know how the first fund is doing and at the time when it's, it's, it's time to uh, invest in the second fund when it, when it comes up three or four years later. So a very long-term, and also I would just say, don't underestimate the additional operational, um, intensity of these, um, you know, anywhere from cash flow, you know, cash drawdowns and distributions happening, distribution of securities in kind, amendments start to arise as you get into late in the life and you need to have a view on those. Um, and so it's, um, it's more complex, but, um, you know, the flip side is there's a tremendous amount of potential for diversification and performance there. So there's a lot of conversation about ESG investing. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a term that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, I think among Catholic investors, there's certainly uh, increased interest and focus on the E part of ESG investment, which is environment. I think that's attributable uh, to, in part, to the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si, uh, and, and just generally the, the focus on climate change and, and uh, issues like that. Uh, you know, as often is the case in the investment world, there's uh, sometimes more spin than substance uh, in, in talking about these things. But, but how, what's the best way to incorporate ESG uh, into, a, into a portfolio? And, and, and how do you educate the, in the investment committee so that you get this right? So that you do it, you do it in, a, in a substantive way. And you, and you, at the same time, you satisfy your, your fiduciary obligation, because I think there is some, there is some uh, yeah, stated or unstated concern that maybe by, by too much ESG, you're giving up return, you're sacrificing return. So Andy, maybe you'd kick that off and then Paul, jump in, please. It's a, it's a big topic. It's an important topic. And it's, as you mentioned, it's gathered a lot of traction. I would, so again, at Hopkins, we went through a process that resulted in the university divesting the endowment of its thermal coal holdings. And that started off as a process to divest entirely of fossil fuels. That was the original proposal. And, and, and frankly, on our investment committee alone, there were various different opinions on, on that topic. So the key first step is reaching a consensus on the universe, or the I'm sorry, the organization, the institution's priorities and values. And I think for smaller institutions, that's easier. For larger institutions with a lot of constituencies, that can be a very long-term 
process and in the negotiation. So I think the first is to come up with a statement of, of values, and then you can have a template that you can enact throughout the organization, but in particular, as we discussed today, in the form of the investment policy statement. Um, so there are a range of, of possibilities from divestment, which I just mentioned. Most uh, investment managers consider ESG is a risk factor when they evaluate companies. So I think that's a, you know, a non-concessionary way to approach it where um, essentially you're trying to head off certain risks that could cost you um, return or, or money um, in the future and, and without really kind of lowering the bar for total return. So I think that risk approach is, is a prudent one. You can have, as you mentioned, lists of disqualified investments. Um, to impact investment where you're actually proactively allocating capital to things that are aligned with the mission so that not only in the grant side or the ministry side of the organization, you're also on your asset side of your, of your balance sheet trying to do additional good in conjunction with, with the organization's values. But I do think that value statement and coming to a consensus on that is really the first step. And, and once you go through that hard work, you can then have your template for for the different ways that you implement those values in the, through the investment portfolio. Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, Tom, I, I, you know, um, my, my guess is that the European Union and the United States are in fairly short order going to be, uh, um, and hopefully in, in concert with one another, establishing new re disclosure requirements on companies with respect to environmental issues, social and governance issues. And, um, Part of the problem for managers of all kinds now is that they don't get as much information from issuers uh, as they might like in order to make some of these decisions. Uh, but Andy's quite right. This is, this is um, a, a trend that's here to stay. And I think it, it certainly, as you indicated, has a, a, a Catholic values context um, on the environmental um, and, and I, I think social and governance issues um, uh, not, not necessarily across the board, but in many respects. And it's something that I think more and more Catholic organizations are going to take into careful consideration as they create their investment programs. Um, and Andy mentioned impact investing. I think that too is going to be, which I think of as different from ESG, um, um, but uh, impacting through investment dollars, uh, the world um, uh, and orienting it more towards Catholic values is going to be, I think, a large theme going forward. Well, we've, we've focused on at CIS, obviously, through our CIS Institute, our, our colleague Jeremy Taylor has really taken the lead in, in trying to educate uh, uh, Catholic investors about ESG and impact. And we're going to do a deep dive on impact, I think, in our April uh, webinar, which is yet to be scheduled. But we're, we're going to try and, I think, take a real focus on that going forward. And, and so, uh, uh, all right, one, one quick question, then we're gonna go to the lightning round with the, uh, with the audience. Uh, uh, Paul, what, what do committees need to, cons or, or do committees need to consider any changes to their traditional governance structures as we move forward? Well, we talked about a number of them, didn't we? We talked about a, a due diligence process that's equal to consideration of non-traditional investments. I think that's important. Um, I think the you know the quarterly meetings are fine, but there needs to be I think an opportunity um, uh, by the committee um, to meet um, in between times, as circumstances suggest, or in order to conduct the kinds of due diligence that can't uh, simply be uh, 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 um, accomplished in a, in a um, uh, in a in a traditional meeting setting. Um, and we talked about the important role of the leadership of the committee um, driving the process forward. Andy, any closing thoughts on that before we bring Zayla into it? Sure. I mean, with full disclosure to the fact that I run an outsourced CIO unit at our, our company where, you know, the, the discretion is, is handed over. I do that. I mean, I believe fully in that, that model of having some flexibility. Um, I do think we saw in the first quarter of last year that it, uh, down cycles are going to be accelerated uh, due to intervention. And so there was a very brief window of a matter of weeks or maybe the month of March, where opportunities became 
uh, cl clear that you could frankly make a say a 10 year or a five year decision, something that would pay off for many years, but you had to make the decision quickly um, with regard to certain investment opportunities or managers who opened and then closed again fairly quickly. Um, so I think just being ready, being able to act in between meetings um, and, and uh, you know, having the governance that allows you to, to act on those type of opportunities. At first, absolutely do no harm, which is don't bail out at the wrong time of the markets. But if you can be on your front foot and be ready um, to, to act, I think that can, there can be tremendous uh, benefits to that flexibility. That's good advice. Well, Salem, welcome back. And uh, you've got some questions from the audience, I think. We have some great questions. Terrific discussion, by the way. Thank you so much. Paul. Yeah, but they, they agreed with each other too much. I just, you know, we need to get, we need to stir the pot here a little more. But. So this question I would like to, um, is towards Paul. Um, as committee chair, what do you do about committee members who are not doing the work and are just dialing it in? And I see that on these Zoom calls. Um, it's not none of our clients, none of our clients, Sayla, but you've, you've heard about it. Yeah, we've heard about it because one person takes over and then some of the others don't get a chance to talk. So how do you, Paul, do you want to start and how do you address that? Well, this, this is a challenge, no matter what your board or committee is. And, uh, and I think the, the leading practice is to take an opportunity um, to do a self-assessment, how the board is functioning. Um, and I think on an annual basis or, or a regular basis of some kind, that that's not a bad thing. Um, now that's different from a peer um, um, a review, which is a, an extraordinarily difficult thing to try to, uh, to, to conduct. Um, but it, it, it helps to surface, I guess, areas of strength and areas of weakness. I would also say I'm a great believer in term limits. Um, I, I really do think that a, a structured process for appointment for a period of time and perhaps renewal, and then, uh, if you will, um, rolling off is a good thing. Um, it gets new energies, um, new perspectives, um, and, and frankly provides an opportunity for other people to provide service to the church. Um, um, in the worst of situations, of course, you just need to have to have a, 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 a direct conversation um, um, including with whoever the head of the organization is that the committee is working with. So following up on that, another question that came in is, uh, again, Paul, this question for you, what is the suggested term of service on these investment committees and the frequency of turnover? Um, well, I, I tend to think in, in threes or fours or fives uh, in, in years, I think for three is probably a little too short um, because there is a learning curve that you've got to get up. Um, five years sounds about right. Um, it could be four. Uh, and then perhaps eligibility, um, but not necessarily assurance, eligibility to be reappointed for an additional term. So I guess I'd land up at about five years. Andy, anything you wanted to add on those two uh, questions? Yeah, I think it can't be too short. You don't have to people turning through because you need continuity. So that's the, that's the trade-off to, to the new energy. Um, at the university, we had six-year terms and you could do up to two. And that works really well if you have somebody fantastic um, who you want to keep. And it's probably a little too long if you have somebody who is not pulling their weight. Um, although, frankly, I think, yeah, it's important to have good enough governance that people can, there's no, no expectation of that second term that people can rotate off. I think just setting the expectations um, at the committee chair level, but just the governance expectations that people are in attendance and that they read the material in advance. I was on one investment committee where those um, expectations were on the front page of the book every quarter. And it was just a great reminder. Um, you know, people show up, they turn off their cell phones, they read the material in advance, you don't beat a dead horse, things like that. And so um, I think just having those and, and setting the expectations. And if, if people are com generally um, doing that, if somebody new comes on, they live up to the expectation. Uh, so it's, it's very, can be self-reinforcing in a positive or a negative way. Yeah, it's amazing how a committee can find its own culture and a culture of success that then rubs off on new members of a committee. It's crucial, it's really important. 
And, and um, just a reminder too, that we put together an ebook on investment committee best practices from our first webinar, Paul, that we did with you in July. And we we're gonna send that out to all registrants. A bunch of these questions are um, answered in there. Um, okay, so next question is for you, Andy. It's, we talked a lot about diversification uh, and any of the groups that you're working with, are they amending their investment policy statements right now during this time to broaden their asset classes available? And you know, we talked about different asset classes, but uh, should people wait a little bit for things to calm down or when is the right time to, to make these I think, changes? So we're in the point now with some clients where this is being raised as a topic of conversation to make those changes. So, I mean, we do our asset allocation studies with clients at the beginning of the year. So the, the, the meetings that are upcoming right now, we will discuss these. And we know we're already ahead of it with certain clients um, because the, the, the concern is that fixed income part of the portfolio. And not only will it potentially not have a much of a return going forward, but there's a, if you have, interest rate risk in there. You could lose money and, and, um, and not be a great um, diversifier either. So yes, uh, we're at the point where it's very timely to have those conversations and to think about with the object lesson of what we went through last year and then our expectations, not over the next year because who knows, right? But over the next 10 years, um, are there changes we should make? Um, and if you're able, you know, considering things like alternative investments, because, um, you know, the, the bond part of the portfolio is, is not going to be, there's not going to be much there um, in terms of return for us. Paul, anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think, I think, uh, I think Andy covered it very well. So uh, we have um, an ESG question that seems to be very popular these days. Um, how do you recommend bringing, and, and I think this question is for you, Andy, how do you recommend bringing IC forward the right education and knowledge uh, to consider ESG or impact investing? Like, do you hold a whole session on educating uh, the investment committee members? How do you do it? Who do you bring in, et cetera? Uh, so we, for our clients, I mean, we're trying to, to bring resources to them, there is literature out there um, that you can avail yourselves in, in case studies. There are some organizations who have been doing this for a long time, which can be very instructive. But I would say lean on your consultant or your provider to the extent that you have one, um, or publications um, from you know the big, uh, the, the large um, investment um, managers and. Um, and, and providers, you know, the, the, the uh, Larry Fink's letter came out today regarding um, SRI and that sort of thing. So there's a lot in the news and, and uh, of uh, examples out there, but we're, you know, we're taking our clients through this as, as their consultant. And I think if you have a consultant that you can lean on or an investment provider, I think that is a, a good first source. And you know, I, I remember Zella the experience of working with asset strategy consultants um, at the Arlington Diocese uh, uh, when Al Morrison, um, Andy's colleague, uh, 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 introduced us to private equity investing, and um, that that was a very timely um, introduction because private equity has become more and more important as a, a factor in the marketplace, um, but it has different characteristics altogether from other investments that the diocese had made and required us to get up a learning curve and required um, also the connections that Al's firm had uh, to find sponsors who would deliver a Catholic socially screened private equity product. So the value I saw in all of that was the independence um, that asset strategy consultants brought to the table because it was not like another consultant that is also a provider of investment solutions itself um, uh, uh, that's trying to sell a product and not just um, um, introduce a committee to a, a new form of investing. I think that's an important dynamic to be aware of. And, and, and Zayla, I'd add that, you know, we're lucky at CIS to have on our board and, and among our strong cheerleaders and supporters, uh, folks who are really 
expert in in ESG and an impact, and so we, we you know we can bring those resources to bear uh, as well. Well, this is I think these are uh, the questions one more that question. we have. One more. Perfect. All right, time. great. Well, thank you. All right, perfect. Well, Paul, Andy, thank you so much uh, for a very valuable program. Really uh, enjoyed uh, the conversation today, and I always learn a lot when I'm with both of you. So I, I'm very grateful and. Uh, Thank you. Thanks even uh, more now to our even more sophisticated audience after that session. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, as Zayla mentioned, uh, there may be some follow up to see if we can provide any additional information. I think Zayla is going to have a short uh, uh, a short survey uh, at the end of the call. So please uh, feel free to fill that out. We welcome your feedback, uh, how we can improve these as we go forward. And, and most importantly, please be healthy and safe. Thank you all very much. Tom, thank you. Andy, really enjoyed being with you. And Zella, thanks so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.